everything is a secret and everything is, you know, kept, you know, only between like this small group of people. Welcome to Profoundly Pointless. Coming up in this episode, we're going to look at the rising popularity of sororities and fraternities. Our guest is Rush consultant, Lori Stefanelli. Thank you for joining us. Like and subscribe if you get a chance. What is Rush? Like for people who are not familiar with this, what is Rush? Sure. So Sorority Rush is the process in which young women, college age, usually 18, fresh out of high school, who are fixing to go off to college and want to join a sorority. So basically what that entails is they sign up to go through the process and they go and visit all the different houses that are on their campus. And then from there, you know, it gets narrowed down to, you know, their choice um, at the end for bidet. So it's essentially like a selection process, right? It's auditioning for a selection process. Yes, I would definitely say it's more of a selection, mutual selection process, both on the sorority side and on the potential new member side. Why is this important? Why is getting into a good sorority or a sorority, like why is this so important to people? Sure, I think it's important to young women, um, especially now. Uh, it's important because it's giving them a community within a smaller community within a bigger community of their college campus. So it allows them to connect with other women who share the same values, who are like-minded, um, and allows them to also get involved in other areas on campus and within the community as well. Um, but obviously for social reasons, right? Like people want to be social in college. They want to have fun and go to football games and parties and things like that. So this is definitely a good place to do that with. And if that makes sense. Is it more than kind of the cool club at the end of the day? It is, to be quite honest. Um, you know, there's a lot of girls who maybe aren't like the big partiers, but instead what they like to do is they are more into their academics. So it um, allows them to push themselves a little bit further because you have to keep up your grades in order to stay in the sorority. Um, it gives them scholarship opportunities as well within the national organization. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's definitely a stepping stone and it opens a lot of do doors for so many women. When it goes through like the rush process, the selection process, is this about somebody's grades, somebody's morals, somebody's ethics, or is this like, she's cute and she's pretty, she looks like us, bring her in the club? Um, I would definitely say it's a little bit of both. So I think more of the like, she's a well-rounded person, we really like her. Um, but there are certain houses at certain campuses that are more like, oh, she's really cute. Like, we would love to have her. Um, we call them looks houses. And so that's kind of like what they're into. And that's perfectly fine. If that's something that you're into as well, then Godspeed. But I think some other girls are more like, we want the full package. I think that maybe for people who are looking this at it from the outside, like for, this is like an inside versus outside thing, mm -hmm. right? Like if you're on the inside, this makes complete sense. And if you're on the outside, this doesn't make any sense at all. Like, how would you kind of explain it to somebody like that might think, what's going on here? Yeah, I think to explain it to someone from the outside, like I always say like, oh, if they're from like Europe or, you know, a different country, because this is truly an American thing. Um, and I think just to explain to somebody about what it means to be in a sorority or what it takes to be in a sorority, it's, it's really just young women, like if you go back and think about it, in the early years of on college campuses in the late 1800s, early 1900s, going to college for a woman was a very new thing. And yeah. so, and there weren't a lot of women on campus to begin with. So they had to create their own groups in order for them to feel supported. And they were kind of like the first feminist groups on campus back in the day. Um, over the years, it's kind of morphed into something else. So if you look back at like the 50s and 60s, it was very much like, oh, she's cute. Like, you know, let's let's have her join our sorority. It was very, um, I guess, a little shallow, if you will, um, because it was just more of like a social club. It was a social organization. You know, when my mom was in her sorority in the 60s, um, it was very much about you know, going to school and getting your MRS degree and finding a husband. And I think people now still think of it in that terms, but y'all, it is in our dear Lord, 2023, year of 2023, like we've evolved, right? So 
I think in the 80s, it became very like passe, like nobody really wanted to join one and a little bit into the 90s as well. But I think with social media, it's really kind of picked back up in popularity. But sororities in general have also picked up on like, hey, we need to evolve in order to stay current and to keep our traditions alive. So now you see that women are joining sororities for a lot of different reasons. It's the connections you'll make during and after college. It's job opportunities. It's, um, like I said, scholarship opportunities. It's ways to network and connect with people. Um, You know, like I said, I work for Warner Brothers Discovery. We have an internship program here. So one of the things that I let my girls know is like, if you're ever interested, we have an internship program for you waiting for the summer. Um, So I think it's evolved into so much more than what it used to be back in the 50s and 60s. Um, But definitely, you know, starting to be a little bit more aware of like what the reputation can be because I think a lot of people still think of sororities as being women who want to find a husband women who are just there to look pretty and like you know whatever um but I think explaining to someone who just doesn't know what this is it's just it's a social group it's a support system for young women when they're away from their families and you know college for the first time it's it's really just a support system Looking at kind of the South, that seems to be the biggest area for sororities and fraternities. On a scale of like one to 10, how important is this for somebody coming into college? Is this like, eh, no big deal? Or is this like, my life is over if I don't get into where I want? I guess it all depends on the person. But I think if you're going to school like a big SEC school, Alabama, you know, Auburn, Georgia, it's a big deal. It's a really big deal. I would say it's like an eight or nine. Pretty far up there, right? But is is everybody kind of getting in to something ultimately, or are there people that are just, man, you're out. You're at, you're at the nerd table. <laughs> I mean, okay. So again, going back to the fifties, it used to be like that. Like if it used, if you had ten sororities on campus and you were meant to be with the nerd table, then you were probably not going to get a bid but now they've made it so that it's more of a mutual selection process right so at the end of the day if you stick with the process you will end up with a sorority will it be the sorority you want probably not um or maybe not that i want I guess that like all really depends on like the girl but at the end of the day if you stick through the process you will end up with the house so as a rush consultant like what are you doing basically yeah no that's a good question i get asked that a lot. like what could you possibly be teaching these girls and i am teaching them a lot having my my background in human resources um allows me to one have sometimes difficult conversations with these girls like sometimes they need to be brought down a little bit or they need to like take a step back and look at the big picture of like what this really is so i have a lot of experience in doing that. But in addition, I help them with the prep of doing it. So that could be the registration process. They now have to make a video. They have to do essay questions. So it's not just like showing up in a cute dress anymore. You know, it's like really walking them through that process. And when you go to a school like Alabama, where they could potentially have 3,000 girls going through recruitment and only 18 houses available, you know, how do you? how do you stand out, right? It's And it's competitive in the sense of like, if there's a houses that certain girls want, it's going to be harder to get into those houses. So how do I help them stick out and shine? And that could be in a lot of different ways, whether it's their social media presence, how they do their video, how they do their essay questions, um, and their conversations during the party. So I help out with all of that. And then wardrobe also. What would you say is kind of the biggest thing that people, most of your clients like, oh, they need, it's usually they, it's this thing that they have to work on. What thing do they need to work on the most? What thing do people usually like, oh, they kind of got this. Since COVID, I think the biggest thing that a lot of young women need to help with is talking about themselves and talking to somebody that they don't know without having a phone in their hand or or whatever. Um, I think ever since COVID, a lot of these kids have been deprived of like social interactions and, you know, joining clubs and sports and things like that. So they're like really hungry for it, but at the same time, they're anxious about it. So I need to kind of help 
them figure out like, what is your story? What is your narrative? Like, how do you want to present yourself to these girls? Let's figure what out what that is. And like, let's craft that into your conversation so that when you walk in, you have a little bit of like, you know, a sales pitch. Um, and I find that a lot of young girls hate talking about themselves. You know, it's like that self, you know, deprecation is like already there. Um, so just really trying to get them comfortable, like, you know, saying things about themselves and even introducing themselves to young other young women. I don't know if this question is either going to be a brilliant question or kind of like an impossible, <laughs> an impossible one to answer. But if you were to design like the perfect sorority rush candidate, what does the hair look like? What's the personality? What's the clothes? What's the shoes? Like, what would you cut? How, what would they look like? Everyone's so different. I, I don't know if I can really answer that because I feel like mostly it's going to be a girl who has confidence, honestly, um, a girl who can pick up very quickly, like anything that I'm teaching her. Um, and then also like, you know, like if she's not the cutest girl in the world, maybe I'm not going to change her. I'm not going to make her go dye her hair and get fake eyelashes and tell her to go spend hundreds of dollars on clothes. What I'm going to do is I'm going to say, that's a really cute dress. But what I would do instead of red, why don't we go with blue? Because I saw you wear blue the other day and I thought it was a fantastic color on you. So it's just like more like, you know, smoothing out the rough edges, if you will. Presenting the best version of themselves. Correct. So I only know about this from like what I've seen on social media. Mm -hmm. And when I look at it, like everybody kind of looks the same. Like this house, they all look the same. Mm -hmm. This house, they all look the same. Mm -hmm. is That's that by true? design. Why is that? That's by design because it's marketing. They want to market themselves as a certain type of house or sorority on campus and it's so that they can pull in those same types of girls and if you notice it's the same exact sororities from the exact same campuses that always do the videos on social media there's a lot of other sororities that you don't see them doing that because they don't have to you know oh so really the ones that you see on social media those are kind of the quote-unquote lower houses I think it's not that they're like a lower house. I think it's just that that's what they like to present themselves at as, and then they like to pull in those same types of girls. So it's not like this is the blonde house. This is the brunette house. Right. This is the redhead house kind of stuff. Yeah. I mean, and honestly, like the, the girls who are the sororities that do those videos, it's the same girls in the same videos over and over and over. Trust me, like those ones that you see with all the blonde girls that look like Barbie dolls, they have the brunettes sitting in the back that, you know, that's just not their jam. Like they don't want to be on social media, but they have specific groups of girls within the sororities that, you know, are the same ones over and over doing those videos. I think that throughout this interview, you can kind of tell that I, I certainly have a certain opinion about it, right? Like, and I feel like I've kind of let that influence this a little bit. Does the way that I'm kind of coming off, is that a true perception? Like that kind of like, all oh, these people are the same. It's vapid. It's blah, 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 right? I'm being dramatic. Mm -hmm. But do I have a good analysis of it? Or am I, are you secretly like, this guy is completely wrong and you're missing the point? I think you are wrong in missing the point. <laughs> okay. Okay. That's fair. That's completely fair, right? Yeah. Honestly, like I, I know society and culture wants us to put us in like this box of like, this is what it means to be in a sorority and this is what you look like and this is what you wear. And it's, it's some, again, there are some elements of that, but it's not everything. And I think it's just a matter of what that sorority is putting out there. Um, to see, you know, like, oh, like, because they're going to attract those same types of girls. So there is an element of it where it's a little vapid and just kind of like shallow, but it really is so much more than that. When you look at like, say, the, the, the rush as a whole, how can you like sum up? I know this is obviously very different depending on colleges, et cetera, et cetera. But how does the whole process kind of basically work? Yeah. So surprisingly enough, most college campuses um, are under the umbrella of the National Panhellenic Association. And the National Panhellenic Association basically is the governing council over all of the national sororities on college campuses. So when you go to a school, regardless if you go to, you know, Boise State, Alabama, you know, Arizona State, wherever you're, Villanova, it doesn't matter where you're going, the foundation of recruitment 
is going to be the same because they all have to adhere to the guidelines, process, and rules of what Panhellenic sets. So they'll do an orientation day, right? So orientation is the first day of recruitment. You go and get assigned um, what they call like a recruitment counselor. Some schools call it like Rokai's, Pikai's, whatever. Um, and she is a woman who has disaffiliated from her sorority for the summer so that she can help prospective new members find their home. And so she's supposed to be a guide, if you will. And so you get assigned a Rokai and that Rokai has let's say 20 girls under her arm. During recruitment, she is saying, okay, this is your schedule. This is where you need to go. So orientation is the first day. Now, since COVID, this is a holdover from COVID. Essentially, you have to make a video and then the sororities make a video. And what happens is they're watching every single potential new member's video. And then you have to watch every single sorority's video. So after that orientation day, you're watching these videos and then you have to go and rank all of the sororities in order from your very, very favorite to your least favorite. The sororities do the same thing, but on a much larger scale, because at Alabama, if you have 13 potential new members and 18 sororities, they're having to do that for 3,000 girls. So they're essentially doing the same thing, but on a much bigger scale. So you'll go in and you'll say, okay, of the 18 sororities I saw, these are my top 10 and then everything else I'll just rank below below that. And then the next day when you go into the second party, day of parties, you'll get an invitation list back of where you got invited. And I think the biggest misconception is that people think like, oh, I'm going to cut this sorority because I don't like them. It doesn't work like that. Like you're ranking them, not cutting them. And so even if you ranked a sorority dead last, you could still potentially get invited back to their house the next day for a party. Does that end up though, like where somebody just, it almost seems like a system that could end up with every kind of nobody getting exactly what they wanted. Correct. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But the point is, is that it's as, again, as long as you see it through, because the point of all the parties is for you to meet as many sorority members as possible so that you can make that decision. Like you might walk in thinking like, oh my gosh, try doubt their Instagram. These girls are so beautiful. I want to be a part of them. They're awesome, blah, blah, blah. And then you get there and you're like, oh, actually I'm not, I'm not quite sure about these girls. And so as you go through all the different parties and meeting all these different women, you'll start to realize like, oh, now it's shifted away from Tridel, and now I'm looking more at Kayo or Zeta or PiFi or whatever. Um, and that's kind of the point of it, right? It's like you want to meet as many people as possible so that you can make the best decision for yourself. And again, they're doing the same thing. If you talk to five girls at PiFi, they're all fig trying to figure out like, oh my gosh, Lori was awesome. She had the best conversations. She was funny. She was, you know, super like bubbly, blah, blah, blah. Or they're going to say like, you know what? She didn't really talk a lot. She didn't ask any questions. She seemed bored. And then that's kind of like how they make their decision of the PNMs moving forward. So you'll go to those houses and every day you have to rank and you get less and less invites back because there's a, a max amount of number that you can get invited back to each party. So, because, I mean, look, if they wanted to invite 3,000 girls back every day, I'm sure they would, but they can't. So, and obviously they want to spread it out evenly amongst all the 18 houses. So, as you go through the process, you're getting your invite list back. It goes, for example, at Alabama, it goes from 18 to 12 to 7 to 2. So, let's say I go get invited back for philanthropy round, and the max number of invites that I can get back is 12. I probably won't get 12. I'll probably get 8. Right. And anything that's not on my invitation list, I'm done. Like, I'm not going back to that house. I'll never think about them, see, see them again or anything. I got to now focus on who is on my invite list and go to those parties and, you know, have a good time and enjoy myself. And then again, out, you go into sisterhood and the max number of invites you can get is seven. I might not get seven. I might get four. And then going into preference, the max number of invites you can get is two. When, when you were going through it, like when you went through the process, did you get to the place that you ultimately wanted? Yes. Oh, yes. congratulations. Thank you. That's good. <laughs> it's my but, number one choice. <laughs> for people, does that, ha how often does that happen though? If you were to put a percentage on it, like 10% of the time somebody gets exactly mm, what they want. I, I, yeah, I would definitely say it's more than that. I would probably say it's like 60%. 
oh, that's pretty good. It's yeah. not like one person out of 100 actually gets what they want and the other mm-hmm. 99 are at like loser, loser five or something, <laughs> right? Like, like- well, it, it's so funny because I remember a couple of years ago, I was helping this girl at Alabama and she was from Chicago and um, she was left with a house that she absolutely loved and a house that she was just like, mm, they're just not my vibe. And I coached her through that. I'm like, when you go in there, this is what you're going to tell this house that you love. And you're just going to knock it out of the park. And like, you're just going to be awesome. And she ended up getting that house on her bid day list. So she was really excited. Success story, right? Yes. Yes. (laughs) So kind of the devil's advocate. I don't know if that's the right question or not. Right. But you see the stuff on social media and let's take that for the grain of salt. Right. Do people, do people of color, do people from less affluent backgrounds, do they kind of get left out in the process? I don't think so. I think when you're talking about certain regions of the country, it can seem like that. But I think it's also because there aren't a lot of, um, you know, people of color, women of color or from different socioeconomic backgrounds that go through the process. Um, Now, if you go to a big school like Alabama, you probably won't see a lot of those women um, rushing. But they're, they're, they are there. It's just not in huge numbers. Um, and I think now at schools, especially in the South, they're starting to realize, again, like we have to evolve in order to stay where we're at. Because at the end of the day, sororities nationally, they function as businesses. They're nonprofits, but they run like yeah. actual companies. And so they realize like, hey, like we need to diversify. We need to, you know, and all forms, right? Whether it's race, gender, sexuality, socioeconomic backgrounds, whatever, like there are programs established to kind of help them kind of break through and get those types of members because they realize that they're only going to be stronger when they have that diversity within their chapter. Um, As a Rush consultant, how's business, I guess? Are you in demand? Yes. Booming. Good. Business seems good from that, right? Yes. I'm already booking for... um, spring so january recruitment how far in advance will people like contact you and get ready for this so if you are rushing in august which is fall recruitment um people usually reach out to me in the winter i would say so prior to even them graduating and i start working with them in april now are they reaching out or the parents reaching out or is, or is like the student reaching out through the parent, right? Like how it's does a little bit of, of, yeah, it's a little bit of both. I would say it's probably 60% parents, 40% young women. Okay. Do you have to manage the parents at all? I, and I say this because <laughs> <laughs> that's, yeah, okay. That is the answer. Yes. I interviewed a previous guest was a beauty pageant coach and he said like, I manage the parents far more than I manage any of my contestants. Yes. What are the What are the parents like? Uh, so there are parents who are just like, I'm stepping away. This is her deal. Like, I'm just here to like, kind of, you know, be the person who's paying. <laughs> and then um, there are parents who love to be on every session, love to ask questions, love to really be a part of it. I've had one one mom who that was a complete, you know, lesson learned on my end to do certain sessions with just the girl and not let the parents in. And she took over. She would answer questions for the daughter. She would interrupt and tell the daughter like, no, this is how you should answer it. Or she would focus on certain things that weren't that important. And it was just, it was a nightmare to be quite honest. Yeah. I think there's always that parent, right? From sporting events to everything, there's always that, Mm -hmm. there's always that parent. Is there a lot of but it, does all of this put a lot of pressure on on younger people, right? Like, does this is this too much pressure maybe for somebody to be handling, or is this like, no, like this is life now, and it, you got to get used to it? Yeah, I think there there are some girls. I, for example, I had one girl earlier this year, and it was too much, you know. And quite honestly, like it, it got it got very overwhelming for her because. I was like, no, you need to change your picture on social media to this, or you need to start following all the sororities on Instagram. You need to put together a social resume. You need to, and it was just too much for her. Like she just could not handle it. So I was just like, all right, you know, like if y'all want to step away, I'm perfectly fine with that. If something changes, 
please let me know. I'm more than happy to step back in and help. Um, and then sometimes you get girls who are just really lazy and think if they show up and look cute that they'll be fine. And like, they don't want to listen to what I say. And I'm like, your parents pay good money to have me help you. So let me help you, you know, and then they'll start to flail. And I'm telling you at the 11th hour, they're like, oh my God, I need help. And, uh, da, 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 you know, I'm just like, where have you been? <laughs> Can't do it. So yeah. how much do you charge? Can you I that? would rather not say. Okay. Um, it's it's not it's not pricey, but what I will say is that I do offer um, like discounts for military. Um, you know, if your parent was like a police officer or anything like that, you know, my father in law is a retired New York City cop, so like I understand like you know having a family member who is a police officer or firefighter or military. Um, Girls who are full ride scho academic scholars, if they can't afford the services, I'll help them out. Um, I had this one girl who, who was going to school at Alabama and rushing. She really wanted to do it, and her parents were just like, "You're responsible for paying." Um, she took two jobs, um, and to help kind of like pay for my services. One of them was at J Crew, so she could use her discount for the clothes and stuff like that for Rush. And then I found out her dad was really sick, and I found out that she was killing herself to do all of this because she really wanted it and when i found out her dad was ill because i lost my father my senior year in college and the people that were there for me were my sorority sisters they were by my side throughout the entire process and i just knew that for her like this meant something and she really wanted it so i just stopped charging her can you make a living as a full-time rush consultant like is this industry big enough that you could do this full-time and be comfortable. Yes. That much, huh? <laughs> yeah. Well, and I live it, in New York City. But is that because that's that in demand or because there's not really that many people who do it? Um, a little bit of both. I will say that um, you know, I was in the documentary Bama Rush and um I would say most of my clients actually come from TikTok. But what I will say is ever since that documentary came out, Everyone's a rush consultant. Everyone is. <laughs> yeah, that's how it works, right? But like, I've been everybody. doing this for 10 years. Okay, now, is there the opposite of, not the opposite of a rush consultant, but is there fraternity consultants? I don't know, actually. I've never come across one. Um, they're, they're just, their process is so different. It's literally, theirs is more like, dude, can you get hot chicks and, you know, to our parties? It's like that kind of thing. Like, how many beers can you drink? You know, it's like, it's just so different. Are you ready for some harder slash listener submitted questions? Yeah, bring it. Biggest mistake most people make? Not coming in prepared, you know, just showing up and winging it um, and not having good conversations. I think a lot, another big mistake is their social media presence. Um, like, look, I was 18. I grew up in El Paso, Texas on the border. I started going over to Mexico, you know, when I was like 15, like I get it, kids drink. Um, you know, biggest mistake is having social media pictures where it's, you know, lip syncing to dirty lyrics or, you know, uh, having red solo cups or, you know, whatever, you know, a white claw, anything like that in their social media, because sororities don't want to see that. And I think a lot of girls think sororities do want to see that. Yeah, that's jumps out at me, right? Because that's, it's like they don't want to see the thing that college is kind of secretly all about. Yeah. Hardest sorority to get into. Uh, it, it's, it varies on by campus, to be honest, because like I was a Chi Omega, but a Chi Omega from my school would have been completely different from like Iowa or Northwestern or, you know, whatever. Like I'm currently involved in the New York City Chi Omega Alumni Association here. And we have Chi Omegas from all over the country and everyone is just so different. School where sorority is everything. Like what schools would you say like, oh, it is everything at these schools? Alabama, Georgia, Auburn, Ole Miss. University of Florida, uh, UNC. Mm, I'm trying to think where else. It used to be Texas, and it's not. It's not a huge thing anymore because like the student population is so diverse now. Um, Indiana, oddly enough. Um, why is it? Why does it seem to be confined almost exclusively to the South? Tradition. 
I think for the most part, like having that tradition, whether it's in football, um, pageants, um, you know, a lot of the women who went to school down there end up staying down there because they're from the area, they're from the region. So they stay down there and their mothers were probably in sororities and their mother's mothers were probably in sororities. So it's this line of tradition that continues and I, I don't want to sound mean or anything, but, you know, if this is what you want to do, this is fine. But a lot of them may not pursue a career. So they, you know, they're in junior league or, you know, anything like that where they're getting involved in kind of like another sorority, if you will. Um, and that just kind of continues and they're a part of it, which is great. Like, that's fine. Um, but then there are areas where, like, let's say the East Coast where you won't find a lot of sorority alums in this area. Um, it's really hard actually to find them. Um, you know, if they're married and have kids and they live in the suburbs or wherever, um, it's harder to find alums living in that area than in the South. This one just says, how much of this is about the boys? No, oh, none of it. <laughs> like, so for, so for example, you are not allowed to talk about boys during recruitment process. You're not going out to frat parties after the part, after your rush parties. You're not um, doing any of that because it's not allowed. And so they want to make it truly about the sisterhood. So if you're on campus going through recruitment and some frat is throwing a rager, PNMs are not allowed to go. Potential new members. Yes, sorry, potential oh. new members. Yeah, they're not allowed to go. Then you don't talk about boys. You don't talk about, you know, who do you mix with or anything like that. That's just considered, like, in poor taste. Because, again, they want to focus on the sisterhood. Oh, this one's kind of interesting. Biggest stereotype that isn't true. That we're all dumb. And that we're only there to party. Do you think that that some of that comes from people from the outside kind of looking at it with a certain mindset? Yes. I think it comes from like movies and television. Um, Because if you think about it, uh, if you see sororities on TV, like the best movie that I can think of that I actually, it's like one of my favorite movies is the house bunny. Um, and, uh, you know, she's like the playboy bunny that becomes like the house mom of a sorority and they're like the nerdy sorority, but she like makes them cool and hot or whatever. Um, but that's a stereotype, right? Like there, it's not a stereotype of the beautiful girls. It's a stereotype of like the bad or loser sorority, but like they have the mean girl sorority that terrorizes them. Um, but I, if you think about it, like, no national sorority ever lends their name out to any movies, books, television series. And there's a reason for that because I feel like TV and, and movies really take that stereotype and run with it and make it so like just gross, I guess. And I think at the end of the day, like they're just trying to protect their reputations. Yeah, and I think that you could see it in kind of my line of questioning necessarily is that movies and TV and media puts it into a category and then no matter how hard anybody tries, it's but it's already in this category. Yeah, and and honestly I think like the national sororities they're like that's fine if you want to think of us like that, go for it, but like we're not like that and that's why they don't lend their names out. How will this impact my life moving forward? Why should I join a sorority at this age? How will this benefit me later in life, basically? I can't even begin to tell you how many doors have opened for me being a part of my sorority. Um, I think that after you graduate, you can do what you want with it. A lot of girls are like, peace out. I'm done. Like, you know, I'm like moving on to the next chapter in my life. And there are a lot of girls who are like, this helped me in so many ways, or this was such a great experience for me that when I move and find my career outside of college, like I'll join the alumni association or I'll go to different events that they, they hold in my city. Um, and it just only connects you to other people. Example in New York city, I've met so many wonderful women who are in different, you know, careers and different stages of their life. Um, but I learned so much more from people from all over the country that I've met here in New York. Um, when I lived in Chicago, same thing. Every single girl that I'm really good friends with was a part of my sorority, but from a different campus. And I get to learn about people and 
you know, how they grew up or what their college experience was like, because it's, it's all different, you know, depending on where you're at. But I think honestly, like it's just the, the connections, the networking, the opportunities, whether it's in your career or, you know, anything like that, it can help you if you want it. You can basically work it to your advantage. What do you really think of all the videos on TikTok? Um, you know, they're cute. They're, they're, I think they're harmless. I think what gets, um, what gets a lot of these girls, not, I don't want to say in trouble, but, um, I think for a lot of sororities, they don't enjoy them because ever since 2021, when all these TikTok videos were going viral, which was outpacing the Olympics during that time, which I thought was funny. Um, I think when that started to happen and then it, the trend caught on last year and now this year, sororities are thinking like, well, these girls aren't serious. They only want clout or they want to get famous. And I think it's a detriment to those potential new members. But I think they're cute. Like, I like it's interesting to kind of see like, oh, like this girl put this outfit together or whatever. And now you're seeing girls of um, different ethnicities, different you know, various different backgrounds. Um, you know, you had Grant Sykes last year who, um, I guess I don't, I, I'm not keeping up with him or following him, but at the time he, or they, um, non-binary. So, you know, it's like really interesting to kind of see all of that, but, um, I, I personally think they're cute, but I can understand why sororities wouldn't want them to do that. What do you think that it is about like people from the outside that kind of, why do you think they're so fascinated by it? Because everything is a secret and everything is, you know, kept, you know, only between like this small group of people. And I think when you have that, like, you know, that secrecy or whatever, I think a lot of people are like, well, what are you keeping a secret? You know, like everyone loves to hear a good secret, right? So I think it's just like, well, what are you hiding? You know, like there must be something there. Um, I think that's why people get fascinated with it, because at the end of the day, behind closed doors, they have no idea what's going on. Yeah, I think I could see that, right? Because you see this stuff and you're like, well, if they're doing this in public, what are they really doing? Mm -hmm. You know, what's really going on? Yeah. Is there usually a big secret behind closed doors or it kind of like amounts to you go behind the secret curtain and it's the secret sauce is just mayonnaise <laughs> and ketchup kind of thing? Um, yeah, I, so this is really funny. At the end of the day, most sororities, like they have an initiation, right? Like at the end of your your um, new member program or pledge ship when I was in the 90s, that's what we called it. But um, at the end of the day, a lot of the initiations are like relatively the same. <laughs> you know, it's like, pretty much all the same. Yeah. And so with that being said, like I think if you did look – and you would just see like this beautiful house with these lovely girls inside. And at the end of the day, it's just a big meeting, right? You meet every week and you have your pledge meeting and you have your, you know, actives meeting. And then you guys are discussing like, okay, homecoming's coming up. Who are we going to pair? I mean, it's really not a, a lot of, you know, anything. It's just really awesome people getting together and having fun on college campuses. That's really all the questions I got. Is there anything that you think that we missed? How can people get a hold of you? All that kind of stuff. Yeah. So my website is greekchicnyc.com. Um, I'm on TikTok, Greek Chic NYC as well. Um, and yeah, I mean, other than, you know, I'm really, I love doing what I do. And I love helping girls reach their full potential while still figuring out who they are. And I think I help out with that a lot. Um, so I'm part therapist, part cool aunt, part, you know, ball breaker. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah.